symbiosi. It's one of my favorite uh, Greek words, I love it. And we're living in a state of symbiosis with technology. You see, the arrow of time points in only one direction. It only goes forward. And just like that, technology progress only moves forward. Think of old ideas or old technologies. They don't get lost. They never die. They don't go away. Rather, they combine and recombine to form networks of interdependent ideas that push us always forward. That's what technology is. As a species, we've moved from the Industrial Revolution to the Information Age now, where everything is moving even faster. So today, I want to do two things. First, I want to talk about some of the positive impacts of our symbiotic relationship with technology. But second, I also want to raise a few questions that, as a society, we should grapple with in this state of continuous acceleration. Starting from big to small, starting from macro to micro, at the highest level, the cosmic level, if you will, there's no higher danger than extinction for the human species. We have no backup. We have one planet right now. This is it. We're staying on it. We're living on it. So at the highest level, how can we as a species deal with the biggest kind of risks, like a, uh, an asteroid hitting the Earth, or a nuclear war starting by some regime? Well, we're investors in SpaceX that lead the race towards trying to establish a colony on Mars. All the things they've done, the reusability of the rockets, the satellite launches, uh, everything that they've done are just steps towards their final mission, which is to allow humans to have a backup on another planet. And that's happening right now. Only slightly smaller in scope, going from the other planets to our own. We have to keep it clean. We can all you know, um, disagree on whether climate change is 100% anthropogenic or not, but there's no disagreement that it's happening. And there's also no disagreement that we should try to do a better job of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Well, technology to the rescue again, between clean technology generation and even more importantly, distributed energy storage, the state of technology in that field is getting now close enough where it can be cost competitive without requiring government subsidies or other market distortions. I believe that in our lifetime, we will see the end of the internal combustion engine. Where I live in Silicon Valley already, there's a very high proportion of cars that are electric on the road. I think within 20 years, if not less, most of the passenger vehicles on our streets will be powered by electricity, which will have a huge impact in cleaning up our planet. Animal-related emissions is another big category. Uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations estimates that something like 15%, 14.5% to be exact, of all anthropogenic emissions are due to animal farming, animal raising. And it's actually more than half of all the agriculture-related emissions. And by the way, that's even higher than transportation. So, as, as raising cattle is an especially inefficient way of using resources. Feed, water, let alone the pollution that they cause. Land, obviously. I know this looks scary, uh, the idea that we will be creating meat in labs, but it's happening. We invested in a company called Memphis Meats that we're very proud of, and there's a number of others that are all working towards this vision of creating clean meat. I'm not talking genetically modified. I'm not talking about feeding cattle some chemical or anything like that. I'm talking about clean, indistinguishable protein fiber that can be created to begin with in a lab, but hopefully eventually in a much larger industrial fashion. And between that, and other agriculture-related technological innovations. Could we see the end of world hunger? So if we have a planet to live on that's clean and we have food, then we have to worry about disease. The intersection of life sciences with information technology is one of the most interesting areas for investment for us right now. You see, it used to be that every hypothesis had to be tested by humans in laboratories using test tubes. But now, because of parallelization, because of robotic automation, and most importantly, because we can model a lot of these questions completely in computers, we can ask a lot of those questions in silico, not in vivo or in vitro, but in silico. 
And the reason why that's important is because when you're doing experiments in labs with humans, you can only scale that so much. But if you can model some of these problems in a computer, then you can take advantage of the exponentially rising power of computation. So you could be testing hundreds, thousands, millions of questions all at once. Couple that with the fact that genetic, uh, the, de the decoding of our genome, the cost of doing that has come down even faster than Moore's law. This is a logarithmic scale, so a straight line is actually exponential. And the cost of decoding genetic information is falling even faster than that. We're starting to understand our life software. We're starting to understand how this machinery is running. And by doing that, we can start understanding how we can fix the bugs in our software, how we can change different things in it to potentially eliminate disease, maybe starting with cancer. There's so much research going on in cancer right now. Uh, I'm very hopeful that there'll be big breakthroughs in the next five or 10 years. Moving on from disease, accidents is another big cause of death around the world. Technology again to the rescue. Between autonomous vehicles, and uh, self-driving capabilities and other safety features, we can make a real dent in reducing fatalities from accidents. Couple that with rethinking transportation altogether. Obviously, these are renderings. These are artists' renderings. There is no tunnel. For all those of you who haven't been to the Golden Gate, there's no tunnel like that. Don't expect it if you go there, okay? There's no picture going to look like that. But something like that could be coming, whether it be next to a bridge, or underground. Rethinking transportation to make it both efficient and safe can reduce, again, fatalities from one of the leading causes of death around the world. Let's go from the macro to the micro, from the general to the individual. We don't have to go far. Look around, right? We're being live streamed right now. In your pockets, you have access to all the world's knowledge, the biggest encyclopedias. You have music. YouTube videos, entertainment, uh, access to educational materials, and all of them practically for almost free. Who would have thought 20 years ago that there would be business models that would allow all of us to have access to these information, local maps to everywhere, in our pocket, for practically free, and yet these business models exist. These are not companies that are losing money. These are companies that are doing very well, and yet we have the wealth of this information provided to us. Couple that with what's coming, there's some virtual reality headgear out there. Um, this is going to be especially important as we think about the importance of training, retraining uh, our, our workforce, and, and learning new skills through things like virtual reality. Take it to self-expression between Twitter, YouTube stars, uh, between blog platforms, photography sharing, what have you. All of you budding artists, journalists, art, uh, photographers, writers, thinkers, you have an unprecedented access to new audiences for what you want to put out there. You see, if you take it all together, Maslow, back in 1943, created this pyramid. It's a well-known pyramid uh, that tried to describe what drives human motivation. And at the bottom of the pyramid, you have things like uh, the physiological needs, you know, nourishment, the need for food, etc. And then on top of that, you have things like safety and love and belonging and what have you. And some of the examples I brought up all have to do with bringing more food, creating a clean planet. So technology is having an impact all across the pyramid. Education makes it easier for people to feel better about themselves. Uh, Self-expression makes people get self-actualized. But what not a lot of people know is that Maslow, later in his life, added a piece to that pyramid. And he talked about something that he called self-transcendence. And that's the ability of the self to think beyond the self, to think about things like nature, the cosmos, the species, others, altruism, things like that. So how is technology doing in our quest towards this self-transcendence? Well, I would say it's unclear whether technology is actually helping or hurting. Think about the uh, resurgence of populism around the world, in governments in the developed world, right here in Greece, in the United States where I live. That's not a very good sign. And there's a paradox with more choice and more control. 
There's a paradox in that maybe we have too much technology because it's allowing us to close ourselves up in comfy digital bubbles where we just, uh, these hyper-personalized feeds of information that we get, if anything, enhance, amplify biases or prejudices we may have because we only get fed the news that we click on. It's more of the same and more of the same and more of the same. So that brings me, well, I should say one more thing, which is income inequality. There's an elephant in the room, right? If we think technology is accelerating and there's some people that can get on that train, they can board this you know, rapidly moving train of great, fantastic technology innovations and others can't, how's that going to look from a distribution of income perspective and perceived inequality and unfairness? It's a societal issue. So I'm not sure I have answers to what it is that we should be doing for all that, but I'd like to pose at least a couple of questions. And I start with this first question that I know will be addressed later on today as well, which is, what will work be like 20, 30 years from now? See, the idea of a 40-hour week is a relatively recent phenomenon. In the US, it was legislated in the 40s. You know, back thousands of years ago, there was uh, the distinction between work and not work was very blurry at best. Right, the farmers, the hunter-gatherers, they worked around the clock as long as they needed to. The farmers, their time was governed by time of day or time of season in terms of what their animals and the land required. This idea of a 40-hour week was only created with the Industrial Revolution when the tasks became more uniform and therefore more repetitive and could be measured in terms of hours. But how is that going to be in the future? when work might be less about repetitive tasks and more about exception handling. Because if you get a bunch of robots that are doing the repetitive tasks, then the humans are there to handle the exceptions. And what is the role of a welfare state in such a society, where it's not about giving people job, a job that's measured in hours, but it's about creating an experience that can fit with what society needs at that point? When workforce adaptability and continuous retraining is necessary, what is the role of the state? I believe we're going to need something like a broad safety net, something like a universal basic income, which is an idea that's getting some support in the States that should be considered very seriously around the developed world over the next 10, 20 years. Related to that first question, the second one has to do with how we think about measuring progress. As we move up as a species, this Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what are the statistics that we should be using to measure how we're doing? Does GDP, does GDP make sense in a world where you've got plentiful food and goods to go around? Is that what it's about? Do quantitative metrics of stuff matter as much? Does life expectancy matter if you've conquered most of diseases? Is this what, what, what was going to be important? So how can a society measure that kind of progress? Well, there's likes. Right? A like is a pretty crude measure, but it is a measure of a digital touch, of a positive impact through a digital touch that someone has on someone else. But it's very crude, so I don't think it's going to be likes. But it might be something that's closer to how we think about the impact of academic research. Right? We, we think about number of citations, we think about journal impact factors where that research gets published. So maybe it's going to be something like that. And obviously the open questions are, what are the weights, what are the things you measure, and how you combine it all together? And more importantly, which brings me to my last question, who decides about all this stuff anyway? Governance is a very interesting question. It used to be, for years, it's been, it's been determined geographically. And there's a, there's a reason why it's been determined geographically, is because the factors of production are mostly geographically linked. Land, labor, most labor, a little less so, but labor still primarily tied to certain geographies. But in the mid-20th century, as capital started becoming a bigger thing, and as capital flows started extending beyond geographic boundaries, you started seeing the emergence of supranational organizations, like the United Nations or the World Bank, to help regulate the flows and help deal with things like poverty around the world and inequality due to capital flows. So, in a world where the factor of production weights shift in favor of entrepreneurship, in favor of new ideas, who decides? 
And what are the kind of organizations that play the role of these supranational organizations to make sure that the rents or the return that goes to entrepreneurship somehow gets regulated or spread around? And also, speaking for us as humans, as we become bigger and bigger members of these digital tribes, as we start defining ourselves as belonging to not just one country, but parts or ways of thinking that, again, transcend national, national boundaries, how do we vote? And what, what are the opinions that we have? And about what and how do they get aggregated? I think these are all very important questions, let alone the whole question you're going to hear about, which is how do you make sure that you have access to unbiased information and news. So as I said, unfortunately, I don't have, I don't have a lot of answers, okay? I know we're living in this symbiotic relationship with technology. And I also know that everything's moving faster because we're in the information age and everything is speeding up at exponential pace in terms of technology. There are some tough questions in our continued quest towards transcendence that we're going to have to, as a society, grapple with, and it's not going to be easy. But optimism matters, right? It's easy to be pessimistic and to find flaws. Being optimistic is what's going to allow us to use technology to find the solutions to the problems that technology itself creates. And I, for one, choose to be optimistic that our future is going to be better than our past. Thank you.